Today, I will be reading from Mark chapter 9, verses 38 through 50 from the New International Version. Teacher, said John, we saw someone driving out demons in your name, and we told him to stop, because he was not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said, for one who does a miracle in my name cannot in the next moment say anything bad about me, for whoever is not against us is for us. Truly I tell you, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to the Messiah will certainly not lose their reward. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them if a large millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off, for it is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands go into hell, where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with only one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where the worms that eat them do not die and the fire is not quenched. Everybody, everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt among yourselves and be at peace with each other. So, um, while researching this week's text, I came across this story uh, from a writer by the name of N.T. Wright, and he told, tells the story that during the Second World War, while London was being heavily bombed, um, one of the cannons, one of the people who work at Westminster Abbey, watched as his house and everything in it went up in flames from a direct hit of a bomb. Uh, the clothes that he had on were the only, that's the only thing he walked away with. And in the morning, he went to, to Oxford and he visited with a friend. And while there, he went to a shop to buy some new clothes. And the shop assistant was surprised by all the things that he was asking for. And he said to him, don't you know there's a war on? Don't you know there's a war on? <laughs> he knew. He saw everything go up in flames, right? He knew what he didn't have anymore. But in our story in Mark, many of the disciples of Jesus Christ didn't know there was a war on. Uh, they weren't aware that there was a war on. They just thought that the war was about Rome. But Jesus, you see, in the very beginning, he goes into the wilderness and he fights the real war with the Satan who tempts him. And he comes out as the victor. There's a war that's going on. You know, right now, you, we as Americans are perhaps, well, not perhaps, we are in the longest protect protracted war in the history of our nation. And how are we affected by it? We're not. If you have family, then you're affected. But for the most of us, our lives go on as if nothing's occurred. We go to our jobs every day. We go shopping. You know, it's not like World War II where there was rationing and you had to get gas slips. And I think if you needed new tires on your car, I, I mean, I... It, that just life was radically changed because we were in a war. But right now, we are in a war, and quite honestly, most of us don't have a clue about it unless you watch the news, and they give you a little inkling of it. But that, to me, that's just a metaphor for where we're at as Christians. We, as Christians, are in a war. And that's what Jesus is teaching here. We're in a war. And I, I hate to use that picture, but that is what's going on here. And he's redefining for his disciples through all kinds of ways, how this war is going on. So Jesus is continuing on his educational journey to Jerusalem. He's headed to the cross, uh, and he's been waging war with the enemy, which is Satan. Uh, it's not the Jerusalem temple. It's not the Pharisees. It's not the scribes. It's the power behind them that he's waging this war with. And again, uh, that's the Satan. Since And he is waging war by healing people of diseases and by casting out demons. 
things that his disciples couldn't do. Earlier in chapter 9, uh, there's a section where the disciples attempt to cast a demon out of a demon-possessed boy, but they can't do it. And then Jesus shows up, and Jesus does it with a word. Now, John, one of the disciples, this is the first time John speaks in Mark, points out to Jesus, hey, Jesus, there's a guy over here who's casting out demons, and we don't know who he is, and he's not hanging out with us. We told him to stop, and he wouldn't stop. What do you think, Jesus? And Jesus says, well, if he's not against us, he's for us. If he's using my name, if he's casting demons out of my name, then he must be okay. He is following me. So the idea that we get in the Gospels, you think there's only 12 people who are followers of Jesus. And yet, as Jesus goes around and he does his miracles and he teaches, and technically most of his teaching is with his disciples, but his miracles are to a bigger audience than just the disciples, there are actually people who are becoming followers of Jesus, even if they don't necessarily know what that means. But so, I can tell you right now, the Pharisees and scribes who would also practice exorcism would not use Jesus' name to do so. Because they don't believe that Jesus is important enough. His name isn't powerful enough to do it. But this individual soul, he knows that in order to get a demon kicked out of somebody, I need to use a more powerful name and the power behind it, so I'm invoking the name of Jesus. This person's recognizing something about Jesus that perhaps even his disciples don't understand, but certainly the religious elite don't understand. And Jesus says, look, you can't cast people, uh, demons out of people in my name and then turn around and be evil. There's, there's this kind of... Uh, continuum that, okay, he's using my name to cast out demons. He's okay. He's one of us. He doesn't really say he's one of us. But he's one of us. He says, don't stop him, for no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able to soon afterward to speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us, for truly I tell you, whoever gives a cup of water to drink because you bear the name of Christ will by no means lose the reward. Jesus was teaching his disciples that they cannot control the message of Jesus. Think about that for a minute. In my uh, walk with the Lord, there's been this trajectory. I got saved at El Paso Bible Church. Well, I got saved at Kelly Hall, but the church I joined after that was El Paso Bible Church, a couple blocks off campus. And I had friends who went to First Baptist Church in El Paso, First Baptist Church, Southern Baptist, big, big, big place, you know. And I'd, we'd meet for Bible studies, and, and I'd always be trying to tell you, you need to come to El Paso Bible Church. Because in my head and in my heart, I thought we were a better church. In my head and in my heart, Little confession. I thought we were the only church. I thought we controlled the message. I thought this was the place. I'm not there anymore. I'm not happy that that's where I was. That's just where I was. And what Jesus would say to me, stop it. First Baptist Church is a great place. People there love me with all their hearts. They're doing stuff down there. Just stop it, Tim. Or the Methodist Church down there on Mesa Street. It's great. It's a wonderful place. It's filled with people who love me. Tim, just get over it. Can you do it? But I'm a, I'm a control freak. And the, and the disciples are trying to control things. They're trying to control how the gospel lives out. And Jesus says, this is not an exclusive message just for you. This is not an exclusive ministry just for you. There are some people out there who are casting out demons, which, by the way, disciples, you're not doing. You tried, but you didn't do it. And there's other people out there who, quite honestly, they're just going to give a cup of water. Now, what's our church? What's your church? What's your ministry? You know, sometimes we're looking, boy, I wish I was, I wish I was casting out demons. That's awesome. I wish I was healing people of their sickness. That's awesome. But sometimes the reality is God's just gifted you to 
to give water to somebody. But here's the deal. The casting out and the water, you need to flip it. It's casting out water. One isn't more important than the other. It is all getting done in Jesus' name. And if it's getting done in Jesus' name, then it's a blessing to whoever it's, ha it's being given to. This is the reality for us uh, as Christians and as a community of faith. We need to determine who are we in Jesus, what's the gifts he's given us, how are we going to serve the body of Christ, whether it's casting out demons and being really cool or we're just giving water. Either way, we're, we're significant people in the kingdom of God because Jesus is with us. Amen? Thank you. I, I wasn't expecting that, but thank you. I like that. In the Old Testament, there's a similar story in the book, uh, book of Numbers. Uh, of course, you know, when you go to the Old Testament, what's, you know, so here's the question, you know, we, we kid around in Sunday school. If I ask a question in Sunday school, what's the right answer? Or what's a good answer? Jesus, right, okay. So in the Old Testament, uh, here's an answer. So if you're going to tell an Old Testament story, uh, maybe <laughs> complaining would be the word that's typically a good answer. So in this story in Numbers, I think it's in chapter 11, uh, folks are complaining, we're sick and tired of manna, we want meat to eat. And they're actually crying about this. Kind of like I am when Claudette gives me chicken, I want red meat. I'm crying because I need red meat. So uh, they're crying that they want red meat, and, and, God's, and Moses are going to figure this out. But Moses, uh, God tells Moses, hey, get 70 elders, gather around uh, the tent of meeting, and he does it. And in that moment, what God does is he takes some of the Holy Spirit off Moses and he distributes it to the 70 elders. Now, here's the problem. There's only 68, actually, because two of these guys hung out in the camp. Who knows what happened to them? You know, maybe they had to walk the doggers. I don't know, but they didn't get there in time. But Joshua notices them, and there they are prophesying and the Spirit's on them, and Joshua tells Moses, you got to tell them to stop. They weren't where they were supposed to be. <laughs> and I like what Moses says. He says, I wish that everyone in the camp would that all the pe Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his Spirit on them. God, we worship a generous God. He is generous with his spirit. Because no one person, no one person, and no one church can do everything that's necessary for the kingdom of God. No one person, no one church can do everything that's necessary for the kingdom of God. So, you know, Paul uses that metaphor of the body. We need feet, hands, ears, eyes, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, local churches need it for us to be who we can be. We need everybody to be a player. But you know what? In the community of Dubuque, churches themselves could be a lung, a hand, a foot. In this community, God has gifted this community with everything necessary to become, uh, to serve him in the community. If we would just kind of link up, okay, that's a big if. Because we're so built in to be like the disciples, to look over there and say, oh, they're not part of us, what are they doing? God is generous with his Holy Spirit. You know, just looking at a community perspective, some churches can do large public things for God, and other churches are just going to do small private things for individuals for God. One is not more important than the other. They are all the same. Uh, they're all ministering in the name of Jesus. But he warns the disciples to not put a stumbling block in the way of others, by criticizing them, uh, by not associating with them, by doing all kinds of things. Uh, so cooperation and an open mind is what God is doing, to what God is doing seems to be a core value of what Jesus is teaching here. I got my 12, but this guy's over there, he's number 13. We, 13 doesn't work well, so we won't number him, but he's working for me. But let him go do what he's going to do. Um, so then he comes, so it seems that instead of looking at others on the outside, Jesus then turns it to say, okay, you're all upset about what this guy's doing, and you don't know who he is, but he's doing something in my name. 
more important disciples, Christians, church, look at yourselves. Look inward. He says here, if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and to go to hell to the unquenchable fire. And, a, and he goes on and just says, hands, foot, eye. Cut it off, it won't poke them out, whatever it is, it's better to have be maimed, have one eye, whatever, than to sin. And he's, Jesus is just pointing out the seriousness of the war that you and I are in. The reality is that out of our hearts comes a lot of lousy, dirty, uh, filthy stuff that we need to do self-assessments about and, and get serious with God about because it's easy, and that's hard, because it's easier for us to look at somebody else and point out how they're wrong instead of looking at ourselves and pointing out to ourselves and admitting to God Oh my gosh, the fact that I even think that person's wrong is really coming. That's a problem I got. There's something in me that's not aligned. There's, there's a problem I have, and I need to deal with it. That is an important thing that I think Jesus is talking about. He's not telling us to physically cut off arms or hands or feet, even though i got to tell you, in the early church, there were people actually doing this and at the Council of Nicaea a long, long, long time ago. They passed a rule that said, stop it. Can't be cutting off your feet, your hands, can't do it. But it, it points out the seriousness of how we're broken because we're in a war. And if we're in a war, then we need to take serious steps to make sure that we're not causing others to stumble and that we're in the right relationship that we need to be in. So what are these three things that he talks about? There, there are a number of things. They stand for all kinds of stuff. Uh, salvation is a free gift that's given to us by grace, it, but it's also personally costly. We become followers of Jesus Christ at a cost. Yes, we pray a believer's prayer or we give our lives to Christ. But here's the other part of it. That entry into that relationship doesn't cost us, but the continuing of that relationship does. Discipleship, the way Jesus is telling us, and discipleship is for every follower of Jesus, is costly. The Reformers called this thing spiritual mortification. Nice word. God's going to require that you and I start giving things up. Because if our life, if, if in the beginning, before Christ, we could be really good, cool, wonderful people, but we still have a war going inside of us, and there's still stuff coming out of our hearts that we're not acting on, Christ comes in and he deals with that. Our lives are going to slowly over time, because of the presence of Jesus and the Holy Spirit, there are going to be things that are going to need to be exercised in our own life or exorcised, taken away, cut out, dealt with. It's not like we just remain the same person before Christ and after. No, there's a change that has to occur. And Christ is going to bring that to our attention if we're giving Christ the attention that we need to. We need to understand that Christ is doing something in us. So, uh, there's, there's just this breakdown of, of sin. He, when he looks at the eye and the foot and the hand, he's just talking here about how sin is so intertwined in the matrix of what makes you and I up, who we are. It's almost indecipherable to know what it is that I need to get rid of. It is so much a part of who we are that it's hard for us to recognize what these things are that need to be taken care of without approaching God and Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. This is a prayer battle that we have to have. This is a prayer battle that we have to have. We need God to point these things out. Uh, so this isn't a surprising thing. This is just a typical reality of who we are as Christians. We need to deal with these things in our lives. Uh, the hand, what we do. The feet, where we go. And the eyes, what we see. We need to deal with that. 
And you know what? Some of this time, here's the other part of this, this little metaphor or hyperbole. Sometimes you've got to give up good things. Can I just say a hand and a foot and an eye? Those are good things. Sometimes what Christ will tell us to is we've got to give up something good because ultimately it leads us in the wrong direction. So it's not our experiences. <laughs> Look, we have to just come to a place in our lives, in our walk with Christ, that the discipleship is going to cost us something. And Jesus is saying, for everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. We are called, according to Paul, to become living sacrifices. I think that's Romans 12. And this is not just some sort of spiritual jargon. Uh, there, it, we do actually have to become sacrifices. The idea of salt was included in every sin offering in the Old Testament. Salt was also added to other offerings. So salt is a sacrifice, an offering. Our lives are an offering back to Jesus for what he's done for us. But it's also a message that says, you know what, cutting stuff off, even though you don't really have to do that, but doing a self-assessment, making the steps necessary to ask God and through his assistance uh, change your life to become the new creation that he's made you is costly, hurtful. It, it's, it's like picking up your cross every day to follow Jesus. There's something that's going on that's not going to be necessarily uh, comfortable. The message puts it this way. Everyone's going through a refining fire sooner or later, but you'll be well preserved, protected from the eternal flames. Be preservatives yourselves. Preserve the peace. So peace in this whole story, I think this is the wrap-up of this whole point, comes through reflecting on ourselves and on our own walk with Jesus. Peace does not come when we get distracted by what others are doing or what others are not doing. Peace comes from looking at, at ourselves, our own actions, our own motivations, our own uh, perspectives, our own biases, our own all this stuff, as we bring Christ into that reality of ourselves and we ask him, hey, hey, Jesus, clean house. Clean house. Please, Lord, clean house. And that's not going to be easy, and it's not going to happen overnight. Uh, there's going to be some tough times that the Lord's going to use in your life to awaken you to a reality. Oh, wow, I really got to work on that, or I got to change that, or, oh, okay, I'm okay there, but this other part of me here needs to be changed. Our world that we live in is chaos. It is. Or at least it seems so at certain times. I just think the world is the world. It's a wor The world is a place that while God created it, it is uh, the, the stuff behind the world is anti-Christ. It, it doesn't go according to the rules of Christ uh, because the Satan is there. So we need to turn our lives over to Jesus, come into alignment with him. Uh, we have to be repositioned with our beliefs and our perspectives, and we need to let Christ do that, and it's hurtful. But when we do it, when we focus on that aspect of it, when we are concerned with where we are with Christ, you know what rules? If we are all in this room saying, okay, Christ, clean house. You know what we're not doing? We're not looking at somebody else saying, well, you need to get that in order. You know, you know why, why do you raise your kids that way? What, what do you do that for? You ain't got time to do that. If you're looking at, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? Lord, where are you in this action? Uh, Lord, where are you in this thought? And I'm not saying I do it all the time, but this is the perspective I think Jesus is putting us to. Where are we doing it? Ask yourself the question, where's Jesus in my action today? Where's Jesus in my thought today? Where's Jesus on the job today? If Jesus must recondition his disciples as to what it means to follow Jesus, then you know what? He's got to reposition us too. If the disciples who walked closest with him need this repositioning, then you and I need it too. Nothing is safe. Not a hand or a foot or an eye. They're all to be freely given up in the name of Jesus. 
So just a few Pauline texts here. Colossians 4, 6. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Or Romans 18.18, 18. if possible, so far it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Or 2 Corinthians 13.11, finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice, strive for full restoration, encourage one another, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. And lastly, 1 Thessalonians 5.13, live in peace with each other. Live in peace. Find peace. If there's a boundary to the church, it would be that the church has peace. When we don't have peace, I just say we're not the church. Because we worship the God of peace. Does it mean that we all, I know he says one line, does it mean that we all think the same way, vote the same. No, that's not what we're talking about. We find our peace in Christ. As we get to know him, we experience peace. And as we get to know others and how they know him, we experience peace. So what I'd like us to do for closing here is I'd like us to stand and I'd like us to read the Apostles' Creed because it is an attempt of the early church to have peace. The worship team can come up while we do this. I know we're a non-credal church. It's in our bylaws. Baptists are non-credal people, even though there's a thick book I have of Baptist creeds. Um, this is the simplest, oldest creed that the Christian church came up with to try to finalize or at least come to some kind of union about what it means to be a Christian. Other than the scriptures, uh, this is an attempt to distill what the scriptures teach about God and Jesus and the church. Uh, and one more thing on this, uh, if, if we can. Uh, in my spiritual retreat thing, we're learning a song called This Is What I Believe. And uh, as the, uh, we sing this song and then we do this reading of the Apostles' Creed. So when we read it, I would like us to build at the end. Not just like monotone read this, because at the end, it gets pretty exciting. So as we go, let's get excited about what we're reading. Let's, let's see if we can do this, all right? Let's stand up and let's try this, all right? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell the third day. He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. 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 Awesome.